The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. When Jesus began his ministry, he stood in the temple and he quoted those words from Isaiah. And so as we stand in the midst of the temple, we ask Jesus to also ignite the light of the Christ within our hearts. We bid the Christ welcome into the temple of our being and we ask that the Christ stand within that temple and anoint our souls to preach the word. We have come together this evening, and may I say good evening and welcome. We have come because we share an interest. It is in the science of the spoken word. It is the ageless science. It is one with the word who said before Abraham was, I am. If we could all read Akasha, the records of all that has ever transpired on earth, we would look back to the years of Lemuria and Atlantis and to civilizations unrecorded, and we would find priests and priestesses at the altar intoning the word, which they also understood to be the Logos, the eternal Christos. Christ means anointed one. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And so that Christ, who has manifest in us and through us from the foundations of the world, is the one who comes to anoint us by the word, as the word, and as the communicator of the word. I could begin my thesis with any of the world's great teachers, I could begin at any point in time and space, whether with Krishna or Confucius or Lao Tzu or Buddha or Mohammed, and I could begin with the word whom John proclaimed. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It is not a coincidence that Christ out of the Greek, comes out of logos and means word. Word with a capital letter tells us the function of our own real self as the communicator of reality. I would like to talk to you this evening about my experiences with the word, my searchings of scriptures of East and West for the confirmation of the word. But I think it all began when I was a little child and then later when I was in high school and later in college. I had three key experiences in which God revealed his word to me. And these experiences were frightening experiences because I came so close to the sacred fire that is God. Our God is a consuming fire. It was in a moment of communing with God and calling upon God, a moment of great need that I cried out to him and I asked him to respond and to deliver unto me the answer to my call. And on three occasions I can remember, out of my desiring and my contact with the Lord's Spirit, I called for a manifestation and within the hour the manifestation was met. It was a simple, mundane request. I was somewhere in the middle of the United States and I needed to get to the other coast quickly. It was an emergency and I said, God, you get me there. And I no sooner walked out of my dorm that there was a man standing there saying, does anyone want to go to New Jersey? And I said, I do. And he was ready to take off. I had never seen him before. And all the girls in the dorm said, you're crazy. What are you doing going out with a man you've never seen before? I said, I'm going. I was home in record time, like 20 hours. 
but I was frightened because I had called to God and that manifestation was so clear. It wasn't that I didn't know that God was an ever-present loving being in my life, but I was beginning to see, and this was the third experience that I had had, that there was a force, there was a power, there was an energy, and there was a science that somehow when the fire welled up within me, creating a fountain that would reach God, God would arc back, and somehow the matrix that I had set forth would instantly be fulfilled. I knew that I was standing in the presence of a tremendous power, and I began to think what that power will do when mankind discover that power and how very near that power is. So I began to search and search for the science that I knew existed. And of course, we've all read of the words of Joel, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I sensed, and I think many of us are sensing, that we live in an age that is the turning of cycles. It has been 2,000 years. The age of Pisces is merging into the age of Aquarius. There are new energies, and we are having visions and dreaming dreams, and we are feeling the Lord's presence. And the charismatic movement is sweeping the churches while others are leaving the churches because they do not find the Lord's Spirit in the churches. They are seeking within the heart. Within the temple of being, they are seeking the reality that they know exists. We have a right to seek. We have a right to know God. We have a right to claim our inheritance. But we must keep humble before this awesome presence, even as we are humble before the nuclear reactor when we know there is that atomic energy, that nuclear fission, and energy is released. We have respect for science, whether it is material or spiritual science. All science involves energy and the equation of energy. I believe that God is energy, and I believe that the energy of God is locked inside of us. And I believe that all of the great teachers of East and West have taught us that the way to unlock that energy is through the science of the spoken word. I also believe that the name of the Lord is a key. Reference is made to the name of the Lord again and again. But the name is concealed or else it is not used. The only place that I could find in all of scripture where the Lord reveals his name and says, this is my name, is in Exodus 3, 14. When Moses experiences the phenomena of God as a fire, God as fire has always intrigued me because it is a sacred fire and fire is something that transcends planes of consciousness. I've discovered that in all of the world's major religions, the great leaders of all time have at one time or another experienced God as a living flame, a tangible flame. But the Lord God spoke to Moses out of the flame that burned in the bush, and yet the bush was not consumed. Can you imagine a fire speaking to you? Our God is a consuming fire. Moses was a very humble soul. He was a shepherd tending the flocks of his father-in-law. And he was commissioned by God to go back to Egypt and to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. An enormous task. Their culture, their way of life was totally involved with the Egyptians. He had to convince them that he represented God and that God had sent him. So he speaks to the flame and says, What is your name? And whom shall I say sent me? And God speaks back to Moses and says, I am that I am. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. 
I am that I am is more than a name. It is a power. It is a statement of being. Whose being? God's being. Where? Where else can God be but within the temple of the heart? Within the temple of man, his manifestation. Where do we look for God when we look for him? Do we look for him in the wind and in the stars and in the sun or in the center of the earth? Or do we look for him in the highest of his creation, his sons and his daughters? We can only translate God by going from the known to the unknown by the process of induction. To find him, we have to find a point of contact. Our point of contact is consciousness. We can speak the name I am that I am and we can declare being and consciousness. We can also say, God is where I am. And by the power of his word, he can also speak his name, where I am. Searching and searching again concerning this name, I found that then when there was a settling of darkness and people forgot God, it is recorded with the coming of Seth. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. I find that in the Hebrew scriptures, right from the very beginning of the book of Genesis, where it says that the Lord God created man after our image and after our likeness, created he him. I find that the Hebrew term for God is Elohim. And I find that Elohim is recorded about 2,000 times in the Old Testament, where we read in English, the Lord God. This is very interesting. Elohim is a plural noun. It suggests a plurality in unity. This plurality created God after our likeness, male and female. We experience then the polarity of the masculine and feminine action of the universe, the passive and the active, the alpha and omega who come forward in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Why is this name omitted and why are we not allowed to experience God as a plurality? Is there a danger that we might come to understand that the declaration of being and the affirmation of God's being is in his heavenly hosts, in his emissaries, in archangels and angels and seraphim and cherubim and all of the key figures who move in and out of the Old and New Testament, walking and talking with Abraham, with Lot, coming to the prophets, speaking to them, coming to Mary in the figure of Gabriel, coming in the figure of Archangel Michael, coming as the two men in white apparel. When we start counting up, all kinds of visitations occur whereby we suddenly realize that God and all of his wondrous manifestations as the heavenly hosts, as that which we call the mystical body of Christ, is actually a plurality in unity. This never detracts from the fact that God is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It doesn't detract from the fact that God is a trinity, a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There is a great mathematics of God. There is only one God and one only begotten Son, and yet one times one times one always equals one. For the purposes of time and space, we find that the great spirit of God is individualized over and over and over again. Take away time and space, and I dare say we would not figure ourselves separately, but we would all know one another as a one spirit as many rays emanating from the one source. And so I could see no division, no argument regarding this plurality and unity, but I could see this one thread, that throughout the scriptures, wherever there is a possibility that mankind might glimpse the power of God, either the scripture is mistranslated or omitted, and we are left with great writings of wisdom and great writings of love. But the keys to unlocking the power, the same power which Jesus declared when he said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. 
that power, the power by which he wrought miracles, the power by which he changed the water into wine, raised the dead, healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, all of this, that power, there is no record left. Where is the record? I've gone to libraries, I've searched, and I have found that in the early church, there was a committee that selected the books that would be included in the Old and New Testament. An equal number of books to our current Bible were not included, but these have been published and republished. They're called the Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden. Many of these books were manuscripts that were available to the Apostle Paul. And some of the teachings of Paul actually reflect almost word for word these early manuscripts. Many things come to light in these manuscripts. But one thing I noticed in the last part of the book of Revelation, and if you will recall, the book of Revelation is introduced as a message that is from Jesus the Christ, sent and signified by his angel and delivered to John, John who was the closest disciple of Christ while John was on the Isle of Patmos, it is considered that is where he received that revelation. And so the book of Revelation was written down exactly as the angel dictated it to John as it came from Jesus. Well, this is understandable considering the closeness of John and Jesus and the exalted state of his consciousness. But there's something very peculiar at the end of that book. It says that whoever will change one word of that book of Revelation, his name shall be stricken from the book of life. I thought to myself, who would ever change the scriptures in the first place? Who would ever tamper with holy writ? Jesus must have known that there were those who would tamper, else he would not have written the warning, because he wanted to be certain that we would have that book of Revelation. It's the greatest mystical writing for this age of Aquarius. It shows us step by step the path of initiation, which each one of us individually are destined to walk when, by free will, we elect to do so. Well, I began to think when I saw all of the books that were omitted, and I began to think when I considered the writings of origin of Alexandria burned, anathematized by the Eastern Church, by Theodora and Justinian. I began to think the scripture may well have been tampered with. And we may have to piece together the power aspect of what has been delivered by the prophets, the patriarchs, the great teachers, as well as Jesus and the apostles by something more than what is there, by the Lord's Spirit, by inspiration, by the pouring out of that Spirit upon all flesh which Joel prophesied, and also by the action of the law that is written in our inward parts. The Lord God, in other words, the Elohim, spoke to Jeremiah, saying, I will write my law in their inward parts. God wanted to be certain that we would not lose sight of his teaching. And he didn't trust that the word would get to us without being tampered with. So he wrote it in our inward parts. Where did he write it? In atoms and molecules and cells? All you have to do is look at microscopic life. Look at the being of man. Look at that functioning of life. And you see the laws of God written there. But we must go to the laboratory to define those laws, to set them forth, to examine, to discover. Wonder of wonders. And so we come back to the science of the spoken word. The power of the Lord's Spirit is intended for you and for me as joint heirs of the real self whom Jesus proved, and he called that self the Christ. And because people have not understood the multiplication of the Lord's body, as he said, this is my body which was broken for you, they have said there is only one Christ, one Son of God. This is true in eternity. But in time and space, that sacred trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit becomes the spark, the threefold spark, that burns upon the altar of our hearts. And this energy, this God, this flame, this consuming fire 
becomes the foundation of the science of the spoken word. And we find that in that consciousness of Christ, we can prove the laws that he proved as he intended that we should do. How do we know he intended it? It's very interesting. He said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. To me the promise is unmistakable, and yet it is considered blasphemy for anyone on earth today to make himself equal with Christ, let alone greater than Christ. It is my understanding that Jesus came to set the example for the incarnation of the word. I believe that if we accept him as the word, that he releases this flame, ignites the flame within us, and we individually experience the second coming, and we are born again because he is one with the Father. And because we now experience that same word, that same anointing that he knew. As we walk with him hand in hand, the fire of our heart, the fire of his heart, can work his works. And by his grace and only by his grace, we together can do those greater things. Let us consider then this action of the word by which he performed all works and by which he bid us to go and do likewise. It is written that Christ cast out spirits with his word. Jesus had tremendous power in his word, and he derived that power from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He drew it forth from his heart center. Catholics have long referred to the sacred heart of Jesus or the sacred heart of Mary. The heart is the heart chakra, It is known by Hindus. It is known by all who meditate to be the center of that burning. It is a burning energy. It is the burning love of God that the disciples knew when they met their Lord on the road to Emmaus. Did our hearts not burn within us? In the chamber of the heart is an altar, and our own real self presides at that altar as the priest, the minister, the rabbi, And in our soul, we can kneel before that altar. We can find the cathedral of the heart as a place of the holy of holies. That word of God is power. Paul said, Christ upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus walked on the water by the science of the spoken word. He stilled the tempest. He said, peace, be still." And the waters were stilled. I don't think that we should consider that the age of miracles is past, but that the age of miracles is fulfilled in science. We should consider that Jesus was the greatest nuclear physicist, the greatest alchemist that we have known in our recorded history. He mastered all energies, all flow of life forces. He mastered time and space. He ascended into that white cloud, the white fire core of the atom of his own self. Hence, we call him an ascended master, and we call all who have done the same ascended masters. We say that because he commanded us to do likewise, and because he said, before Abraham was, I am, that there have been many sons and daughters who have proved that oneness with God, mastered time and space, both before and after the advent of Jesus. It is written that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. I believe that that is another record of one who ascended through that mastery of time and space. And Elijah was caught up into a chariot of fire, and Buddha's disciples saw him taken up, And we have the acknowledgement of the assumption of Mary, the mother, and even John, the revelator, of his ascension. All of this by the power of the word. 
Paul said that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word. The washing of water by the word is an amazing concept if you meditate upon that in your own heart, sitting under your own vine and fig tree, under your own source of communion with God. First of all, the church always figures as the bride of Christ. And we are told that we are the temple of the living God and therefore we can consider ourselves to be the church. Christ loves us because we are really the church. Organizations, temples made with hands, doctrine and dogma, these are not the church. The church is only alive when people are living kindled flames. The church is a white cube. It's the philosopher's stone. The church is consciousness. The washing of the water by the word to me means an alchemical action whereby the waters of our consciousness are cleansed as we invoke the word and as we through the word invoke the sacred fire. That sacred fire is a baptism which we are all waiting for if we remember the words of John the Baptist. He said, One cometh after me whose shoes I am not worthy to unlatch. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Always returning to that fire. Fire over and over again. It is a sacred fire, a cleansing fire. It's the fire in the core of the atom. It is energy. That energy is God. God didn't walk into the office of a scientist, of Edison, or anyone else. He let man meditate upon the lightning for thousands of years until someone decided to capture the energy, harness it, and use it. Could it be that he expects us to do the same? To experiment with that fire that is God and in a spiritual way harness it and do those greater works which Christ promised. I am looking for the washing. The washing of the waters by the word. Again, it is written of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation that fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Not out of their hands, their head, or their stomach, or their feet, but out of their mouth. It's a clue to me, because I have a hypothesis that I'm about to prove. It means that the fire that proceeds out of their mouth, it says it devours their enemies. To me, it is an action of the sacred fire and of the word which they have mastered. Isaiah said of Christ, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. And when we read of the faithful and true in the book of Revelation, his name is the word of God, and his outstanding feature is that out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. What is this sword? You even look at the word, it has S and then word, sword. Maybe it's an abbreviation for sacred word. It's coming out of the throat center, which the Hindus long ago acknowledged as the power center. And through the use of mantras over thousands of years, the intoning of the word, the name of God, has been the basic form of meditation of yogis. Could it be that in India, their teaching and their understanding has come to us from the long-lost continent of Lemuria? James Churchward writes a number of books called The Lost Continent of Mu. He found tablets in a monastery in India which the priest had guarded, they said, for thousands and thousands of years, which had been brought to them from beyond their shores. The priest knew the interpretation of these tablets of stone. Churchward became a disciple in this monastery, and he was the only man, as far as he knows, that was given the key to these tablets. So he deciphered them, and he has four or five books of his decipherings. But there is a description of Lemuria, of the temples, and there are stones that have been found in Mexico that have the same hieroglyphs. They speak of four cosmic forces, and we have in our scriptures the four beasts that were on the four sides of the Ancient of Days. 
in Daniel and in Revelation. These four forces and the release and the science of the spoken word were discovered on these tablets. Perhaps the thousands of years of mantra are a tradition that came to India from that very place. Now the use of this science, after all of our investigations, after all of our consideration of scriptures, cannot be proven until we try it. In the trying of the use of the word, only then can we experience in our own laboratory, to me a laboratory and a cathedral, a church, they're one and the same. They're the place where we go to meet our God and to commune with him and to discover the secrets of our soul's evolution and of the cosmos itself. Let's experiment with this word, and then I want to tell you some more about the experiences of others with the word. In the first place, the most sacred word of the East is simply the word Om. I have described the use of the word Om, three letters, A-U-M, in this book on the Great White Brotherhood, of whom all the ascended masters are a part. It is the Trinity, the A standing for Alpha, the U as your universal self in manifestation or as the anointed Christed one, and the M for Omega. So it is Father, Mother, the divine polarity of a cosmos, focusing in on and manifesting you, the divine you, the potential of being. The chanting of the Om that has gone on for thousands of years is for the ascending of your consciousness into the white fire core. It doesn't really mean up or down. It means in another dimension, which I like to think of as the center of the atom pulsating with energies of spirit and matter. May we say this OM and feel what it does to the room itself. It actually changes the level of awareness. If Om is the name of God, then why did he reveal his name to Moses as I am that I am? That's quite a question, and I thought it must be a question of energy. So I pursued it on that basis. And then I looked at East and West, and I said, the energies are very different. They are so different that entire evolutions have a different way of life, a different emphasis. And they say east is east and west is west and never the two shall meet. And I looked at I am that I am and it suggests two planes of being separated by the that. God doesn't have to declare I am twice unless he's declaring himself in one plane and then in another plane. Well, the two planes which we hear about are heaven and earth, spirit and matter. And so we find the polarity. We find I am that I am really means that God is saying, I am in heaven, that I am in earth. I am that I am. I am the universal presence that is in manifestation on the altar of your heart as another focal point of the Trinity, the threefold flame. So then I learned that the statement, I am that I am, evokes the energy of the white fire core into manifestation for the mastery of time and space. Why master time and space? For one thing, it's an impelling force within us. We all feel that desire to master, master ourselves, master a discipline. We have a movement within us that's moving toward the law of perfection. But more than that, God has given us a decree. If you've never read it in the Bible, it really doesn't matter because it's written in your inward parts. And that decree is, take dominion over the earth. 
That's why we seek to master time and space. It's burned on the very atoms of our being. So after we have meditated and gone within, what's all the use of this meditation and going within? It's so that we can come out again and master time and space. So for the going in, we give the chant Om. For the coming out, we declare God's being as in heaven, so on earth, as above, so below. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We find then the path of the West, the mastery of matter. The path of the East, the mastery of the spirit. If you've traveled in the East, especially in India, you find people are very little concerned with outer accoutrements. A simple loincloth, barefoot. The people are concerned with things beyond, with the past life, the future life, with reincarnation and karma, with the gurus. And not until Western civilization transported itself to India do we have the beginning of the change. In the United States, we have developed the highest civilization, technology, in the mastery of matter anywhere in the world. If this is materialism, that is, if it is the mastery of matter without the flame, it is a dead end. But if it is materialization or mater realization, then it is the science of mater, the science of the mother. Then it has a point. It's the science of the word. It is the proving in matter of what we have learned in spirit. It's the proving on earth of what we have gotten in that white fire core. It's the reason for our meditation in the East. So we have incarnated in the West. We are burdened with all of this technology and civilization and the war machine and the corporations and more and more money and more and more money and where is it all ending and... We work round the clock and we bring home the money and we pay it out in taxes and we pay it out in our daily bread and life is over and pretty soon we're on a pension. And what was it all about? Well, if it's not matter realization, there is very little point for it, to be sure. But if it is, then we find that it is the culmination of all incarnations of the word in all time and space. It is with Jesus that mastery mastering time and space so we don't have to see it again. So we don't have to be reborn again and again. So we don't have to keep going through this round all over again. So we can finally ascend into that white cloud that is the white fire core of the atom. And so we have a purpose to all this technology, all this science, all this matter realization. It is endowing matter with the flame. That becomes the purpose of living. And in order to do that, we have the key. It was never omitted from sacred scripture. And I always think that we're mighty lucky when we find the keys in scripture. And I think the reason they're left there is that they're coded, waiting for a meditation. I think the ones who tampered with scripture didn't realize what they left in the scripture. Let's chant that name of God and feel God truly coming into our temple when we say, I am that I am. 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 What's happening when we release that energy? We're going to our own sun center. It's spelled S-U-N and S-O-N. We're going to the center of Christ where he lives in us. We're also going to the sun center, the center of energy. Even physically, the heart is the center of the flow of energy. And we're saying, by the free will God has given me, I will raise that energy to the point of the throat center and I will release it as Jesus taught us, as Gautama taught us with the authority and the science of the spoken word. I am, when we declare it, means God in me is. Right where I stand, God is. That is not saying I am God. It is saying God is all that is real where I am. 
and I'm going to affirm that reality. And by that reality, I'm going to conquer this force field, this energy field, this body temple. I'm going to conquer it in every way. I'm going to conquer my mind, my heart, my soul, my physical manifestation. And I'm going to use this energy field, this body temple, to glorify that fire, that sacred fire, and to serve that fire in every other energy field that we call sons and daughters of God. There's a very interesting mantra that we give, and it invokes the fire of the Holy Ghost as the fire that is a violet flame. The violet flame has been revealed to many people in this age. Some of you have heard of the Master Saint Germain, and he released the violet flame a number of decades ago. But I've talked to people who were Catholics who told me that when they kneeled at the altar, they saw the violet flame after many days of prayer. And I've talked to young people who've gone into the mountains fasting and praying. And I said to them, what did you see after you fasted for a week? They said, among other things, I saw a violet light. And then I've talked to people who've taken drugs. And they've also told me they've seen a violet light or a violet flame or sometimes violet flowers. And I don't think you have to take drugs to discover God. But it seems to be a common religious experience that has happened in East and West. The Ascended Masters have given to us the understanding that the violet flame is the flame of freedom. It is also the flame of transmutation. It is also the flame of the soul chakra. It's also the flame of the age of Aquarius. And with all of this, it is the action of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Isaiah said something very interesting. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Well, many of us have believed for centuries that Christ has the power to forgive sin. And we can understand that statement right there and end it. Or we can ask further, how can I get more of this fire? How can I get more of this baptism? How can I get this forgiveness? Well, I believe that this is an answer to the prayer of millions. And I'd like to give you this mantra, and I'd like to ask you to experiment with it. Because really, I'm not here to talk to you for what it does to me. But I'm here to give you something to work with. Because it's high time that people had a working relationship with the Holy Ghost. A working relationship with the energy of God. And so I don't ask you to take anything I say except that you prove it. Prove it in the crucible of your own heart. But in order to prove it, I ask you to take the steps I've used and many thousands have used and see if they work. And if they don't work, develop your own method and tell me what it is. But try this one because people have proven that it works. The name of God I am, when spoken, is the bursting of the white fire core of the heart, the release of energy. Whatever you affirm following that statement must cycle into manifestation. We create ourselves, we create our worlds, we create our consciousness. So we say, I am sick, and we are sick. We say, I am well, and we're well. How about saying, I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. Instead of trying to get something or use our knowledge of God's energy for success or money or power or politics or whatever it is, let's affirm something beautiful, something real, something that matters to the inner self. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. When we say I am, we're saying God is. God is a being of violet fire. God is the purity God desires. What we're saying, I'm going to get this unreal self out of the way. I'm going to let God come into his temple, and I'm going to let God speak his word through me. Do you think you're speaking when you give forth the science of the spoken word? No. It is God speaking through you. It is Christ speaking through you. It's your real self. You know, Christ is a word that has become a stumbling block. 
And so you don't have to use that word if you don't want to. You can just say real self. Everyone has a real self. We all know it. We all have a consciousness. We all have an inner attunement. We know there is a point within us that is absolutely real. A point that will transcend this clay vessel and be on and on and on with God. That's the real self. Gautama called it Buddha. Mary called it Mother. Jesus called it Christ. Moses heard it declare, I am that I am. Call it what you will. It is a point of energy, and we have to get to that source. So how about trying the violet flame and visualize yourself standing in that flame, and let's just say together this mantra. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. God in me is a being of violet fire. God in me is the purity God desires. God in me is a being of violet fire. God in me is the purity God desires. God in me is a being of violet fire. God in me is the purity God desires. God in me is a being of violet fire. God in me is the purity God desires. You know, one of the masters once said that life should not be a spectator sport. And I find that when I'm lecturing, people like to watch me giving this mantra. Sometimes I feel like I'm behind bars in a zoo, you know, everyone's come out to see what this thing is. And they watch me giving this mantra. So I always say, you really can't prove if I'm right or wrong if you don't say it where you are. You can't watch me and say it doesn't work because you don't know what's going on inside of me. And it won't happen in you unless you say it. So if you really think that you have an understanding of science, then I say, prove it. Prove if it works or prove if it doesn't work. But if you don't use it, you'll never know. I'd like to pass out to you now some books of decrees and mantras and prayers that we've collected. And I'd like to ask you to try another couple of mantras with us. I have a lot more to tell you about the science of the spoken word, but I'd like you to get into it a little bit. It has to do with meditation. Meditation is a silent aspect of the spoken word, the same science. It's using another chakra. In fact, meditation uses a lot of chakras. Meditation centers in the heart. It centers in the third eye. It centers in the crown. It centers in the base of the spine. We have a couple of books on this kind of meditation, Studies of the Human Aura by Dwal Kool, showing these centers of consciousness where we experience God in different ways. I'm all for experiencing God in all ways. But this evening I'm talking about the science of the spoken word because of the tremendous impact it has had on my life and the tremendous changes it has worked in me. There are a lot of different mantras in this book, but I'd like you to turn to page 68 with me now. There are transfiguring affirmations which Jesus gave to his disciples. Some of these you'll recognize and some of them were not recorded. But remember when you say, I am, it's declaring that where you stand, God is. And whatever you declare afterwards is being fulfilled. Now may we give these together. And remember what they said about Jesus. He spoke as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes in their academics, in their intellectual mindedness. But the authority of the spoken word was upon him. In the name of the real self of all, I call to the real self in the flame of Jesus and Gautama to unlock the word within each heart, and let each one speak now in the fullness of the God-Self, the I am that I am, together. 
I am that I am. I am the open door which no man can shut. I am the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the resurrection. I am the ascension in the light. I am the fulfillment of all my needs and requirements of the hour. I am abundant supply poured out upon all life. I am perfect sight and hearing. I am the manifest perfection of being. I am the illimitable light of God made manifest everywhere. I am the light of the holy of holies. I am a son of God. I am the light in the holy mountain of God. With words such as these and similar words, Christ anchored his miracles in the physical plane. They were already manifest in the heaven of his consciousness. He already knew the perfection of those whom he healed. He already saw their wholeness. He had to bring it out in the physical plane. We can think about things, we can feel things, we can experience them somewhere in consciousness. But to rearrange atoms and molecules, we must use the center of authority. It is the seat of that science whereby the word becomes flesh. And until the word becomes flesh, the light shone in the darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. And so until your life is transformed and people can see the action of the word, they don't really understand God. Until Jesus came, they didn't know or understand his laws. On the opposite page, there's another decree to the violet flame, page 69. It's a good mantra to memorize. And the preamble, which seems long, actually, is an addressing of the heavenly hosts. These are the cloud of witnesses, or what you might call the mystical body of Christ. And they are names of beings who, with Christ and with Buddha, have confirmed this violet light throughout a cosmos. Let's try the mantra by itself and see if we can get into the swing of the giving of the mantras. You know, when you give a mantra, you take a deep breath, you use the diaphragm, and then we're reminded of the breath that is spoken of in the book of Genesis when the Lord God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. If you've ever seen a baby born, you've seen that waxen figure, white, almost bluish, and you see the first breath and you notice that the pink area comes out from the heart and expands. You are watching the kindling by the Holy Spirit of the flame on the altar of the heart and the inbreathing of the Holy Spirit. The masters call it the sacred fire breath. Your breath itself is an aspect of the Holy Spirit. When you use the breath with reverence, it gives a flow to your decree. You know with your breath you can save life, and without breath we lose life. So if you'll take a deep breath and let this sacred fire breath of God flow through you, this is also an action of the word. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. Now see a flame burning in your heart 
and visualize it with your eye, your third eye, your inner vision. Visualize it as violet, as violet light. And as you give the decree, watch it expand. It will expand to fill your temple, fill your aura, until you really are that being of violet fire. Let's try it again. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet in a Hour I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. Just as you can't tell what I'm feeling when I give the invocation, I can't tell what you're feeling. Communion with God is a very individual experience. I can tell you what I'm feeling and experiencing, and you might say, well, she's just an ordinary person just like me, so if she experiences it, maybe I can too. And that's true. And so I'll tell you that when I give this call, as I have done so for many years, I begin to feel God as a giant waterfall, and the rushing of that water becomes a sound. It's a sound of fire, flowing fire, or flowing water. And it's interesting that on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles received the Holy Ghost, they were all with one accord in one place. That means they were in one consciousness, in one place. And the Holy Ghost descended and it filled all the house and it was like the rushing of a mighty wind. Well, one day after I had given these violet flame calls for some time, I began to hear the wind rushing in my inner ear. And the power of that wind was so intense that I could not hear any physical sound around me. All I could hear was the wind. And therefore, for me, God had proven the science of the spoken word, and he had proven the prophecy of Joel, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I was using the name I am, and I was calling for the Holy Ghost. I found, however, it didn't happen the first time I gave the call, and so I began to ask myself why, because I knew someday somebody would ask me why. Somebody would say, well, I don't feel it. So I began to study the science of the chakras, these points or centers of awareness that are beyond the physical and yet connected thereto. They are nerve centers, seven centers of the seven-fold aspect of the Christ. And I started to realize that people who have never meditated or prayed or communed with God, and yet they have been moving in this world and have been incarnating again and again, have a lot of accumulation on those centers. It's just like you look and you see leaves clogged in a drain when it has rained. So I realized there was a lot of effluvia clogged around the chakras, chakras that were intended to be an experience in God for want of use. And so I realized when the violet flame was first invoked, it begins to clear away the debris, but until the debris is cleared, we can't use those centers to experience God. The senses of our soul have been, for a while, turned off because we have such an emphasis on our culture, on physical senses, empirical experience. So I realized that just because we suddenly call in the name of the Lord after several thousand years of wandering around down here, doesn't mean to say that he's suddenly going to shoot back the fire of the Holy Ghost. It takes patience, it takes proving, it takes experimentation in that chamber of the heart. It takes faith. It takes belief. Every scientist has to have faith in the hypothesis that he's proving or he wouldn't even start. Faith that there's a law that exists somewhere and by persistent effort we're going to prove that law. And so 
I've watched now over the years hundreds and thousands of students work with the violet flame, and I have found that anywhere from a day to days to weeks to even months, it takes everyone a different length of time. But by and by, at least 98% of the people I have known have reported to me that same experience of the flowing of energy in the chakras and the listening to the sound of the wind of the Holy Ghost. So I can only say, if it interests you, try it. Let's give it a few more times now, and then I'd like to do a meditation with you. This time, let's give the preamble and invoke the presence of these beings who have meditated on the violet flame for thousands of years. Together. In the name of the beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me and my very own beloved Holy Christ self. I call to beloved Alpha and Omega in the heart of God in our great central sun, beloved Saint Germain, beloved Portia, beloved Archangel Zadkiel, beloved Holy Amethyst, beloved mighty Arcturus and Victoria, beloved Kuan Yin, goddess of mercy, beloved Aramis and Diana, beloved Mother Mary, beloved Jesus, beloved Omri Tas, ruler of the violet planet, Beloved Great Karmic Board, Beloved Lanello, the entire spirit of the Great White Brotherhood and the World Mother, to expand the violet flame within my heart, purify my four lower bodies, transmute all misqualified energy I have ever imposed upon life, and blaze mercy's healing ray throughout the earth, the elementals, and all mankind, and answer this my call infinitely, presently, and forever. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone. I, I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like the sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. That's a good beginning. The Master Kathumi, who was embodied in the West as a very great devotee of the flame of Christ, Saint Francis, has given to us in the studies of the human aura a very interesting exercise for the strengthening of the aura. Each chapter in this series of writings is on some aspect of the mastery of the aura through the sacred fire, through the word. The particular exercise on the strengthening of the aura has a threefold action which he describes. He says the student begins by visualizing the threefold flame expanding from within his heart. This threefold flame is the action of power, wisdom, and love, or the Trinity, and it has a color aspect. We see it as blue, yellow, and pink. Blue as the power of the Father yellow as the wisdom of the sun, pink as the action and the love of the Holy Spirit. When you think of it inside of yourself, you can see it expanding in your temple, and you can see it like a flame of blue as energy coming in, drawing from your left hand, on the altar as the yellow, extending through the right hand as love. The masters have a threefold action, heart, head, and hand. The hand is the, always the extension of the power of God as love, as service. So will you all close your eyes and visualize that in your heart now? See a blue fire on your left, a yellow fire in the center, a pink fire on your right. He then seals himself and his consciousness, Kuthumi says, in a globe of white fire. How do you do this? You say, in the name of the Christ, my own real self, in the name of the I am that I am, I call forth the white light for the sealing of my aura. Now visualize from your heart center 
an expansion of white light that fills your aura like an ovoid, an egg-shaped light. It goes beneath your feet, above your head, until you are seated now in an action of white fire, and all you see is this white light and the threefold flame pulsing upon your altar. Forget about the self that is physical. Let all your energies flow to your heart. Experience yourself as the flame and God as the flame. Then Kuthumi says, and when he is set, he proceeds to recite the following words with utter humility and devotion. These following words have been reprinted for you on page 68 of your Decrees Fiat's book. So we'll have the light turned on. While you hold your visualization, turn to page 68 and feel this action of the sacred fire flow through your spoken word. Page 68, I am light. Everything you say, the word is speaking in your heart. It is being affirmed, and by science, it is being manifest. So let God now speak in your heart together. I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensified light. God consumes my darkness, transmuting it into light. This day I am a focus of the central sun. Flowing through me is a crystal river, a living fountain of light that can never be qualified by human thought and feeling. I am an outpost of the divine. Such darkness as has used me is swallowed up by the mighty river of light which I am. I am, I am, I am light. I live, I live, I live in light. I am light's fullest dimension. I am light's purest intention. I am light, 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 flooding the world everywhere I move, blessing, strengthening, and conveying the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. Let's step it up now. I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensified light. God consumes my darkness, transmuting it into light. This day I am a focus of the central sun. Flowing through me is a crystal river, a living fountain of light that can never be qualified by human thought and feeling. I am an outpost of the divine. Such darkness as has used me is swallowed up by the mighty river of light which I am. I am, I am, I am light. I live, I live, I live in light. I am light's fullest dimension. I am light's purest intention. I am light, 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 flooding the world everywhere I move, blessing, strengthening, and conveying the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. I am light, glowing light, radiating light, intensified light. God consumes my darkness, transmuting it into light. This day I am a focus of the central sun. Flowing through me is a crystal river, a living fountain of light that can never be qualified by human thought and feeling. I am an outpost of the divine. Such darkness as has used me is swallowed up by the mighty river of light which I am. I am, I am, I am light. I live, I live, I live in light. I am light's fullest dimension. I am light's purest intention. I am light, 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 flooding the world everywhere I move, blessing, strengthening, and conveying the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. That is a very interesting action of the white light that comes through the action of the seven rays. The seven rays come from the prism of the Christ mind. We think there is no record of the use of the seven rays. Well, I found one, and you can decide whether or not it's true for you. I found in the book of Joshua that there were seven priests bearing seven trumpets, and for six days they circumambulated the city, and they carried the Ark of the Covenant. The seventh day they encompassed the city seven times. And the seventh time when the priests blew their trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. So the people shouted with a great shout. The wall fell down flat, and they took the city. 
You know, if we started doing a thing like that today, people would say we were Satanists or black magicians or practicing witchcraft, walking around, blowing trumpets and walking around the city like that. But because Joshua did it, it's okay. Well, it's very interesting. Seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days, and the seventh day they go around seven times. It must have something to do with the seven rays. At least for me, it must. I thought that was very interesting. That's one of those other things that got left in the Bible. Now I have another story to tell you. I have a lot of favorite people in the world, and they come out of every church, and a lot of them aren't in churches at all. But they all have one point in common. They have discovered something about the energy of God. And I'm very happy that God has given me the freedom to love all these people. Well, there's a story that I'd like to tell you, and the story is about Amy Semple McPherson. And she was that preacher that founded the Pentecostal movement and had the Angelus Temple in Los Angeles. And I'm just as inspired by her as I am by Mother Cabrini or by Elizabeth Ann Seton or Joan of Arc. Well, she had an experience that I think is really amazing. She was out in a tent and all kinds of people were gathered and the problem was they had erected their tent on a football field that boys from a Catholic school had been using and they didn't like the idea that this revival meeting with this woman preacher was being held on their football field. So what they did, the football players, they surrounded the tent and they started jeering and laughing. And they were so loud and so bad that they actually couldn't hear the speakers anymore. They couldn't hear Amy speaking, they couldn't hear the soloist sing. And actually it was proven later that they had some kerosene in the bushes and they were going to set fire and they really had some wild things they were contemplating. So Amy records in her book that she writes about her life that she was really despondent. So she had everybody sing hymns and they sang hymns and they sang hymns and pretty soon they were singing hymns until there was nothing else to do because every time they stopped they would hear the jeering and they couldn't carry on the meeting. So she sat down and she said, Oh Lord, what shall I do? We've all said that sometimes. Well, we don't always expect to hear an answer. Well, she heard an answer. It kind of startled her. And the Spirit of God spoke from within her and said, Begin praising me out loud. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So she spoke back to the voice and she said, uh, But Lord, how can I praise thee when I don't feel like it? When I feel like running away, how can I praise thee? And here's what the Spirit said back to her. Do you praise me because you feel like it or because I am worthy? It's a very interesting question. Of course, she answered, because you are worthy. And so she started in a small little meek voice. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. And she started off and she found other people were answering. Amen. Glory, glory. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, praise his holy name. Well, she started and she kept on and she started building momentum until, just as we're speaking, God in her was actually the word and the spoken word and the fiat. And she said she looked up and she must have seen with her inner sight and some of you may or may not believe in a vision like this, but it can be described as a subjective or an objective awareness. Maybe she was seeing her own subconscious, maybe she was seeing the collective unconscious. But anyway, what she describes is a ring of demons that were surrounding the tent with bat-like wings interlocking. And she said every time she said, praise the Lord, praise Jesus, the demons would go back until finally with all the congregation repeating this they disappeared and she looked again and she saw angels robed in white and each time she would give the affirmation praise the Lord praise Jesus these angels would advance and they kept on advancing well at the conclusion of this period the football players were silenced 
She went on to give her sermon, and you know, she was noted for speaking in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And she was noted for healings, and she would call people to the altar, and they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they would speak in tongues, and they would be healed. So what happened was, after she delivered her sermon, even the football players came to the altar to receive the Lord Christ. Now to me, that's an experience in the science of the spoken word. And it leads me to something that I've been talking about in this book that we put together called The Science of the Spoken Word. It's something that Isaiah wrote about commanding God and about the action of that word, the command. Isaiah wrote, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I was amazed when I found that in the Bible. God is actually telling us to command him. But concerning what? Concerning the work of his hands. Well, the work of God's hands involves the plane of matter, where we live. This is the world of effect. God, the first cause, we live in the effect world. So the work of his hands has to be whatever is manifest down here. So God told Isaiah, command ye me concerning the work of my hands. There's an association between the call and the answer. Jesus always called, and he always got an answer. He prayed to God concerning Lazarus, and then he said, Lazarus, come forth. It's the interaction of energy. It's quite an amazing science, and you can read about it in here. It works for me. It worked for Jesus and Gautama and Mary. It's worked for everyone who's ever prayed everyone who's ever had an answer to a prayer. I have definitions in this book of the different forms of the science of the spoken word, the prayer, the invocation, the mantra, the chant, the decree, the fiat, the affirmation, and the call. It says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. All of us have had that experience of the call. Oh, God, help me. People that don't even believe in God will say that, or they'll just say, oh, God. But the affirmation of that word brings a response. And the more understanding we have, the more quickly it manifests. Is there an interesting thing that God actually said about his word? And it's written in Isaiah. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. It shall not return unto me void. We are made in the image and likeness of God. If God's word does not return unto him void, can our word return unto us void? It is energy. It goes forth. We are told that in the day of the judgment, by thy word shalt thou be justified, by thy word shalt thou be condemned. Every idle word that goeth forth, thou shalt give account thereof. Well, I want to say one more thing, because people always ask me about vain repetition. Didn't Jesus warn us about vain repetition? Well, Lord Maitri, as some of you know him as the coming Buddha, writes in this book, he says, certainly the mere vain repetition of words is in itself completely ineffectual as Jesus taught. Therefore, the wrong premise exists in the minds of those who assume that the giving of decrees is vainly repetitious. Let those who would learn God's truth place their own ideas temporarily aside for a moment as I expound to those who are willing to become as little children for the purpose of receiving this instruction upon the importance of employing in the present day methods of dynamic decreeing. Jesus was speaking about the heathen. I went to Jerusalem and I saw the wailing wall and I'm certain they have a right to their own form of prayer. But their prayer is in the form of going against the wailing wall. 
Now, he may not have been speaking of those rabbis. He may have been speaking of other forms of prayer that were being given. He counseled that we enter our closet. I don't think Jesus meant a coat closet. I think he meant the chamber of the heart, going within to pray, going inside into the temple of being. It's interesting that the only prayer he taught us is a command. Every word of it is a command. Have you ever thought about that? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's a command. Let your name be hallowed on earth. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. You are telling God, you are commanding God, that his kingdom or his consciousness should come on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. Is it a command or isn't it? Are we begging or pleading? No, we're commanding. It's the imperative that is written. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in the plane of matter as it is in spirit. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Every word is a command. And yet when we talk to people today about commanding God, it's frightening. People think they shouldn't command God. Yet he taught us to pray, to enter into the closet, and give that fiat. It is a real fiat. Now I'd like to do some meditation with you. And I think the meditation will be more effective if I can get you to give one more violet flame decree. It's a meditation on the chakras. So if we can take our books once more for the last time, turn to page 16. This is a mantra of the Apostle Paul. It has a very special rhythm. Rhythm is important in the science of the spoken word. I'll give you the rhythm and ask you to join in as it is your free will to join or not to join. Loving God, presence I am in me, hear me now, I do decree, renew past each blessing for which I call upon the Holy Christ self of each and all. Let violet fire of freedom roll round the world to make all whole, saturate the earth and its people too, with increasing Christ radiance shining through. I am this action from God above, sustained by the hand of heaven's love, transmuting the causes of discord here, removing the course of the undue fear. I am, I am, I am the full power of freedom's love, raising all earth to heaven above. Violet fire now blazing bright in living beauty is God's own light, which right now and forever sets the world, myself, and all life eternally free in ascended master perfection. Almighty I am, almighty I am, almighty I am. Loving God, presence I am in me. Hear me now, I do decree, reign of ass each blessing for which I call upon the Holy Christ self of each and all. Let violet fire of freedom roll round the world to make all whole, saturate the earth and its people too, with increasing Christ radiance shining through. I am this section from God above, sustained by the hand of heavens, transmuting the causes of discord here, removing the course of an undue fear. I am, I am, I am the full power of freedom's love, raising all earth to heaven above. Violet fire now blazing bright in living beauty is God's own light, which right now and forever sets the world, myself and all life eternally free in ascended master perfection. Almighty I am, almighty I am, almighty I am. What am I doing when I'm speaking these words? I'm visualizing. God where I am, Jesus where I am, Buddha where I am, and all of the fire and the momentum of the flame of the word that they had anchored in my heart. I visualize my heart as one with the heart of all the saints. Then I ask in my heart that their momentum of the Christ be released through me to the earth. I visualize this flame of violet light filling my own aura, going forth from me and circling the entire earth touching everyone on earth, lighting every aura with the light of the Holy Spirit, and returning back to me. I feel the flow of God. I hear that sound of fire and of water. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I feel the flames actually coming upon me as a coolness and as a leaping action. I feel that spirit moving, and I know that in the science of the spoken word, 
Everyone on earth in this very moment will be touched by the Holy Ghost. This is my faith, but it is a faith that is based on proof. I feel that I have proof of the science of the spoken word, and I hope you will also find that proof. Now, if you can intensify your inner vision, see your heart one with the hearts of all who have ever walked the earth in Christ, feel yourself one in the mystical body of God, feel ourselves as one being. Nothing can separate us from this love. We share the one flame. Let us be one as we release this word together. Lovely God, presence, I am in me. Hear me now, I do decree me to pass each blessing for which I call upon the Holy Christ self of each and all. Let violet fire of freedom roll round the world to make all saturate the earth and its people too with increasing Christ radiance shining through. I am this action from God above, sustained by the hand of heavens, transmuting the causes of discord here, removing the cause of the none new fear. I am, I am, I am the full power of freedoms of raising all earth to heaven above. Violet fire now blazing bright in living beauty as God's own light, which right now and forever sets the world, myself and all life eternally free in ascended master perfection. Almighty I am, almighty I am, almighty I am. The teachers of the Far East who teach us that all mantras come out of the Om and are a manifestation of the Om, they teach us that all mantras return to the Om. And in the final analysis, there is only one word, and that is Om. All other words are the words, words, words of the one word. Well, after you've given this invocation, as I've given it probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times in my life, it becomes a single word. And I'd like to show you how that, these many words, can become one word so you can see how you can step up and accelerate your vibrations with the use of the word. Love the government, I am in me, hear me now, I do decree me to pass this blessing for which I call upon all the grace of a beach and all that by that fire of freedom roll round the world to make all those that breathe earth and people do with the grace of radiance shining through. I am the second from God, above the same with the hand of heaven, subject to the cause of discord, and removing the cause of a new fear. I am, I am, I am the full power of freedom, self, raising all the true heaven above, Father, if I not busy, inviting, living, beauty, is God's own light, which right now in reference to the world, myself, and all life, eternally free, and a sin of mass perfection. Almighty I am, Almighty I am, Almighty I am. The energy of that intonation of the word is so intense that it actually takes the soul into a state of bliss. And the bliss is so intense that you just want to keep on letting the action of the word flow. You know, God has given us a challenge. You know what he has said? He has said, prove me. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The proving of the Lord or the law by the Logos is your opportunity in this hour. I hope that I have given to you this evening that point of contact where you will want to go out and prove it for yourself. When I met Mark Prophet in 1961, who founded the Summit Lighthouse, I was in Boston studying at Boston University political science. And I had already heard of the Ascended Masters, and I was looking for these Masters of the Brotherhood. And one day it happened that Mark Prophet was coming to town to speak, and I happened to find out where he was going, and I went to hear him. And I sat down in a very little group of disciples in an upper room, and Mark Prophet was there, and he was seated, and he gave a sermon, and then he gave a dictation, the first dictation I ever heard, and it was from Archangel Michael. Well, I had always known Archangel Michael because he's in the book of Revelation, and he was revealed to Daniel, and besides, I always felt his presence as the angel of faith and protection. And I was amazed that this man had the gift of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, that is, being able to interpret that universal spirit and make it specific by
by being the instrument of a member of the angelic hosts. And when Archangel Michael spoke, it was as though he was speaking to me, and yet I knew he was speaking to everyone. He was powerful. I knew the Holy Spirit was there. And I knew that the speaking in tongues that came upon the apostles, that I was watching this phenomena occur again in our time. And I realized that as people who have the gift of tongues speak in different tongues, some in the tongues of earth, some in the tongues of angels, I realized that this plurality of God as Elohim that I had come to realize was appearing throughout the Bible existed in heaven and that many people could receive the Lord's Spirit and this particular man was actually bringing down the Lord's Spirit in a very specific word applicable and needed in that hour. And so I heard El Moria, an ascended master, speak to me and tell me also to go with Mark and to be trained of him and to learn of this gift of the Holy Ghost. So I followed Mark to Washington and I was trained and we worked together to build the Summit Lighthouse as an outpost for the masters to publish their teachings. And so all of our books, and there are many that you can look at, have come as the inspiration of this spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that is the entire spirit of the Great White Brotherhood. It is the fusion of all of those who have ever walked with God and ascended into his presence. It's the fusion of that consciousness which yet remains individual so that we can identify a being of God as Gabriel, as Michael, and as others of whom we have not heard until they speak to us.